today we are in a subject that uh, for me has been one of the most spiritually enlarging subjects I've ever encountered and that is the, uh, the prophecy of Daniel but specifically the wonders that occur to which he referred as wonders when he said how, sh how long shall it be till these wonders are fulfilled um, that occur from chapter 11 verse 40 through chapter 12 verse 7 we are on the second wonder, which is Michael standing up, and we have defined Michael by its meaning that uh, he is, is in a uh, rhetorical statement when he says, Michael stands up, the, the great prince that stands for my people. In that, Michael means who is like God, and when Michael stands up, we have understood that to mean that Christ stands up um, to defend Israel as its Messiah and to uh, create the hosts of which he is the Lord. And uh, that standing up is a very conspicuous, miraculous event, which is the literal meaning of the word wonders in the Bible. It's going to be one of the greatest events that have ever occurred since the foundation of the world, since it's the culmination of the history of the world in the um, the battle between the image of God who is in Christ and the saints and the image of man is when the, um, the nations that were spoken of in Daniel's prophecy in chapter 2 uh, consolidate and come against Israel to battle as, as the prophets speak of over and over again. So in all of this, we learned in Daniel 7 that there's a reference to Jesus uh, to the ancient of days coming in clouds. And then when you read the Olivet Prophecy, you also read that Jesus says he is coming in clouds. So that coming in clouds has been interpreted since the beginning by Christadelphians, um, since the beginning of our community, as uh, this great cloud of witnesses, which in that day will make a testimony to the world, along with Christ, of his power, having been raised from the dead, having been consolidated into his strength, which is the... Um, the army or the hosts of which he is the Lord and now having been elevated in the eyes of the world and its political heavens as being the, um, the true Messiah, the true deliverer of Israel and the true king that will sit on the throne of his father David. Uh, when they are recognized as such, every eye in this world will see or understand that it was Jesus of Nazareth who was the Son of God from the beginning and now has been revealed to the world. Um, this is, an, uh, this is a, a, an unprecedented event in the world because um, to contrast to that, when he came the first time, the royal majesty of the kingdom was standing right in front of him and they couldn't see him. So when he comes the second time, the royal majesty of the kingdom will be standing there in the eyes of the world as the image of God who has just laid waste the image of man and all of his politics and his, his ideologies and uh, will be recognized uh, on a global level. So not even recognized by the people in his immediate vicinity who should have known who he was and then when he comes again recognized by the whole world because that's actually what God means to do with this lightning light brightness of the rising of Christ in the, um, in the world. In that subject, we have seen how, how Daniel and Matthew are speaking about the same things, and elsewhere in Scripture, he has spoken of his coming in clouds. What we want to go over today is the spectrum, I'd like to call it the full spectrum, and I think it, in a way it is, although it's not all the verses, that are used to describe um, how God had Christ in mind when he created clouds in the first place, and how he has used clouds and spoken of clouds with reference to Jesus, and in particular, his second coming and his rising in the eyes of the nations. Um, to me, this is a subject that is of such profound beauty, uh, so deep and wonderful, something that no man in his imagination could contrive as a theme. It has to be present in scriptures as something that has come only from the mind of the creator of this world. Uh, because there are too many correlations, too many themes that come up in different contexts that come together in this perfect, cohesive picture of God's intention to fill the earth with his glory as the waters cover the sea. 
and in that cloud, when it is seen again in that day, God will remember his covenant. So uh, beginning there in the spectrum of clouds in the scriptures, I'd like to, to, to go through these verses, something I can't do when I do this in a one hour class, um, because we're, these slides, which I've been speaking about for three weeks now, are all supposed to be condensed into one class. What we have the opportunity of doing this summer is actually savoring the scriptures, I think, which is where the substance of our faith really, really is formed. Um, if we skip over things too quickly, we just don't glean uh, the, the, the incredible, profound sense of what God is speaking about when he speaks perfectly through the words he chooses to describe having seen his son for example, as we are here in the clouds. So let's turn to Daniel, uh, to, excuse me, to Genesis 9. And once again, what we are looking at is Michael standing up and being recognized. That standing up being the time at which this cloud of witnesses is formed, both from the natural witness of the Jews in Israel, who Christ will deliver as a remnant, as their Messiah, and for the elect who are gathered from, uh, who are first resurrected, then get those who are alive gathered to Sinai where they will be judged and, and formed into the cloud of the other witness, that spiritual aspect of Israel um, that, that is the greater witness um, than natural Israel has ever been. He recovers from his isolation in the ark in the flood, and he says to him, in beginning in verse 11 of chapter 9, And I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there be any more a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant, the sign, which I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. Let's just pause here for a minute to define what living creature means. The term living creature comes up again in Revelation, um, and it's a reference to, to creatures who are drawn out of the animal nature of this world to become everlasting living creatures. They are otherwise referred to as dying creatures. Um, the animal population of this world, including those people who live uh, with the mentality of animals and animal flesh, um, are dying creatures. That's from the beginning. The pronouncement was made in the garden. Dying, you shall die. They're not living creatures. They're dying creatures. Dying from the time they are conceived to the time they die. Um, but a living creature is one in God's mind who will never die. And that's what life really is. Why he says, choose life that you and your descendants may live. So, he's speaking about every living creature that is with Noah. That is to say, with the righteousness of Noah by faith. For perpetual generations, obviously, uh, symbolized by animals who were chosen to be spared in the ark uh, over and above the human population of the world, which was apparently more animalistic than the animal population in its, in its violence and imagination of evil. So he says, I do set my bow in the cloud. Now speaking of, of the rainbow and its colors and its overarching uh, power and its full spectrum of light. As, it, uh, as light shines through it, it shall be a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. So, so you read this and you think, okay, so God is saying, I'm going to put a, a sign here. And the sign is going to be when you see the bow in the cloud. And I'm going to put a cloud over the earth. Would God be speaking about a literal cloud? in this promise of a covenant. Does it make sense that he's going to put a literal cloud over the earth? I mean, I'm sure it was a literal cloud that he showed Noah, and these are literal clouds that we look at when we see bows in clouds and marvel at the beauty and grandeur and even the meaning of it. But when God designs things in the natural creation, he has a spiritual intention in mind. Just like he says in John 1, there wasn't anything that was made that was not made without Christ in mind. Um, so, if that's the case, then this, this cloud that covers the earth, that's going to become a sign with this bow in it, is something that God means to do on a spiritual plane, not just a natural plane. So he says in verse 15, I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, 
and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall be, shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every, every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. What God is speaking about when he says this is the formation of of witnesses who will take their place with Christ as his, his host of people, his royal administration at the time when he is rising politically in this world. And that cloud that will be seen is that cloud of witnesses. And that bow in the cloud is the full spectrum of God's overarching power in this world as it will be manifested by Christ when he subjugates the nations to his will. So that's the first reference to clouds, and it's just in the context of God making a covenant. So, the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant. So, there's the connection between the cloud and the everlasting covenant, which is, as Malachi puts it, an everlasting covenant of life and peace, which is on the lips of of the priest, and in this case it's a prophecy of, of Jesus, uh, upon whose lips has always been the promise of this particular covenant, that God would manifest himself in, in his glory in this great host of people. So that's, that's the first reference to clouds in the Bible, and you can see how deep and marvelous it is. The second reference comes up, and, and these may not be all the references, so I don't mean literally second, but the second reference that we're isolating for this uh, to follow this theme is in God manifestation in Exodus 34 uh, verses 5 through 7 where Moses asks to see God and God reveals himself to Moses it says the Lord descended in a cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord keeping mercy for thousands so we understand that God manifestation that name of the Lord I will be manifested in whom I will be manifested is the manifestation of God's character and his life in thousands by virtue of mercy through faith that has been enacted at the time of the second coming of Christ. That's when this happens. So, once again, um, he's, he's making a testimony to natural Israel in the wilderness because they were also, I think, an unwitting witness in the thousands that were collected there. But this mercy for thousands and this proclamation of the Lord um, was meant to represent what, what God would reveal in the image of his son. And he, he saw it from behind, looking forward. We see it from, from forward, looking back. Uh, so that would be God's manifestation. And let's just take a look at, his, at Exodus 34. Beginning at verse 5, it says the Lord descended in a cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So there's the cloud and there's the name of the Lord in its proclamation, which means I'm going to be manifested in a great host of people who will fill this earth in the end with my glory. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, Merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands. That's, this, that's the, the manifestation that God is speaking of when he said, I will be manifested or I will be who I will be. It's those thousands, thousands upon thousands, and in the end, uh, myriads that no man can number. That only happens because of the mercy of the Lord, because he's forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin and will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation so that's the second place and it's speaking about clouds in the context of God manifesting himself by his mercy in thousands and you remember that when, it, when the second coming of Christ is spoken of in Daniel, it's spoken of with reference to thousands upon thousands in, in Sinai, as it does in Deuteronomy and as it does elsewhere in Scripture. 
So the next one comes up when they are wandering through the wilderness and there is a cloud, you know, a cloud um, led them by day. And the cloud appears frequently. If you read uh, through the law, um, the, the cloud comes up uh, often in the context of God's meeting with Israel and appearing in the tent of the congregation or the tabernacle. When you read tabernacle, it means tent or booth. And when you read tent or booth or tabernacle in the law, you are referring to something which in the New Testament is the temple of God, now holding his word, not in a box, in a tent, but having been written upon the hearts of those men and women who are with whom God has made this new covenant. And so it's always, though, where God dwells with his word. In the case of Israel, it was in a model that was representative, I think, of the physical model of the kingdom, embodying also the model in the New Testament of a spiritual temple in which God resides in the hearts of men and women of faith. So it says in Exodus 40, 34 through 38, And a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. All right. In this case, it was a literal tabernacle, but it was symbolic of the glory of the Lord filling the temple of all those of faith at the time of his glorification under the rulership of Christ in the kingdom. So let's go there and look at that. We were in Exodus 40. In context, it says, then a cloud covered the tent of the meeting, of the congregation. So there's a cloud, and it's, it's engulfing the tent of the congregation. In other words, the cloud and the congregation are now integral in the presence of God in the wilderness. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. The cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and the fire was on it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So again, if you go back to the theme that we are following, the congregation is also in uh, one of the contexts in which the clouds are cloud of, is spoken of, then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation. It's also in the context of the glory of the Lord. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. What is the glory of the Lord that will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea? Well, right now the waters cover the sea with people who have fleshly nature. In the day of Christ's appearing and in the end, the glory of the Lord will be the, the earth full of those people who have followed the Lord in faith and who have been elevated from animal nature to the everlasting nature of God. So you can't speak about the glory of the Lord without referring to that. And that is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's the unity between God, His Son, and those who are created in His image. This wonderful unity. Um, of all those who will be like God in their minds in the end. So it's a beautiful figure, but look at what's happened so far. We have the covenant in the context of clouds, uh, God manifestation in the context of clouds. We have the congregation, the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord in the context of clouds. Once again, the word tabernacle was there in the previous verse, but let's look at this one in Job because it gets very interesting when you look at the... the the, the depth and wonder of Job's references to clouds. So now let's now turn to Job 36, verses 26 through 33. Job 36. Now let's start. Let's start at verse 25. Every man may see it, or it says in the, the English standard, all mankind has looked on it. 
man beholds it from afar, what? What exactly is he talking about? Behold, God is great, and we know him not. Neither can the number of his years be searched out. For he makes the small drops of water. They pour down rain according to the vapor thereof, or they distill his mist in the rain. I'm just going to pause here to say, hold on to that thought, because we're going to go into that in a few minutes um, in a way that um, shows that when God made clouds in the beginning and how they coalesce, and how, how water from the earth rises to coalesce in the heavens and make clouds where the bow will appear, where God's covenant will be, be witnessed, that he's also thinking about the fullness of those clouds and the rain that pours from them when they are full. These thoughts are so lofty. They are so wonderful and magnificent that you can't help but appreciate this. Um, uh, only with fullness, the fullness of what we are given to understand in this. So he continues and he says, which clouds do drop and distill upon man abundantly. Also, can any understand the spreading of the clouds or how, how they're dispersed? And then this strange line, the noise of his tabernacle or his temple. So we were just reading the God manifestation and the glory of the Lord were seen in the tabernacle. And then we come to the, the, the Job's apparent reference to the natural clouds and the rain that comes from them in their fullness. And he refers to it as the noise of his tabernacle or as it's put in the, the English standard, the thunderings of his pavilion. In other words, the pavilion being this great dome of the sky and then this magnificent uh, voluminous thundering that comes out of it. And he says, if you look at the words here and you know God, you know he's not just speaking about that. God is very deep, and when he speaks, he's covering all dimensions that language can cover, expressing his mind. Behold, he spreads his light upon it and covers the bottom of the sea, really. So God now disperses his light upon the spreading of the clouds. And in the context of the noise of his temple, I think in contrast to the noise of the waves of the waters of this world. And then he says this, by them he judges the people. Well, you could say, well, that's right. Didn't Jesus say that God sends rain on the just and the unjust? But if he does, and that's his mercy, where's the judgment in it? If he judges just and unjust alike by sending rain upon them? Well, that's his mercy, yes. And it's his care for his creation, yes. But is it maybe something else? For by the spreading of the clouds and the rain, he judges the people and gives meat or food in abundance. What, what meat is it by which he will judge the people in the future? What meat is it that the world will eat that gives them, that sustains them in the days when they don't only eat the food of this world? With clouds, he he covers the light, it says in the other version, he covers his hands with lightning, another key word in the work of Christ as it operates from him as king, and commands it not to shine by the cloud that comes between. So there's bright clouds and dark clouds, and, and clouds can, can be full of light, and they can also obscure light. So once again, what's the context here? And the context is the operation of God through clouds to judge people and that by the use of light and rain and shadows. So going back to our list here, um, he's speaking of the tabernacle, of the, of the, uh, the noise of the, of the tabernacle and by then he judges the people. And if you look at the way I've kind of condensed it here, and you understand that, as we've already said, the premise is, but we're going over the premise in a scriptural theme, that the, the spreading of the clouds is the dispersion of the saints as kings and priests in this world to judge the world. We know this is true if we read Ezekiel 1. We'll be going there in a minute, so 
hang on, and we'll see this as it's expressed by God to, to, in a direct prophecy at the time of Christ's rule. But if that's the spreading of the clouds, and in that is the realization of his covenant, um, then the, the, the noise or the thunderings of his tabernacle is the, uh, this irresistible volume of God's law that comes to the world in the time when he judges the people. Uh, there will be saints who are, instead of the noise of violence in his land, will bring the noise of his temple to Israel. And if you can, you can understand the way God uses language, this is a really clear picture of what he's spoken of in so many other references where he refers to these things pertaining to the second coming of Christ and Michael standing up um, by the use of the same language, which we will continue now to look at as we go through this. Um, he speaks of his judgments also in Job, and this is another place where Job correlates with what we just understood. So let's look at Job 37, chapter 37. All right, so, you know, if you could just start at the, at the beginning, I don't have this highlighted, but um, Job is saying at this, also my heart trembles and leaps out of its place. Keep listening to the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. Now, where is thunder apprehended in this context? It's apprehended as the voice of God, which will be initially expressed by Christ from his throne, but also um, carried forth in this world by the saints. So it, it goes on to say, under the whole heaven he lets it go and his lightnings to the corner of the earth. After it, his voice roars, he thunders with his majestic voice, and he does not restrain the lightnings when his voice is heard. God thunders wondrously with his voice and does great things that we cannot comprehend. So the only point I think that, that we can make in its simplest form here is that we shouldn't just confine our understanding of what Job is speaking of here, of God inspiring through, through um, his, his testimony in Job. Um, we shouldn't think of it just as a, as a natural, sort of on the face of things, because God's voice is a bigger thing than what the Indians used to worship when they heard thunder in the sky. It's just not enough substance in thunder for anybody to get uh, the message that is, that, that is, is uh, and its fullness in the true voice of God, which is his word. So when the, they come together here, analogically speaking about God's voice as thunder. And so if you go down to verse 11, it says, he loads the thick cloud with moisture, or it gets full of its, its condensation that has been come from the, the, the earth and now is coalesced in a vantage where every eye can see the fullness of this witness. That's his thick cloud, and it's full. And the clouds disperse his lightning, which is spoken of in Revelation chapter 1 and elsewhere in Scripture as the, the emanating from Christ in the form of his, the brightness of his rising and his power, the brightness of his power. It's bright because you can't resist seeing it in that day. It's that bright. It's the light of the world. And so it's fitly described as the rising of the sun as it is in Malachi 4 and as lightning and everywhere else where it's spoken of. So he's saying this thick cloud, if, if we want to be direct here, of saints that have coalesced from the waters of this world, now in a, in, a, in a heavenly place, they disperse his power in this world, his lightning. They are therefore the, the full strength of Christ's power. They turn around and around by his guidance. Does that sound kind of like a a whirlwind to accomplish all that he commands them on the face of the inhabitable world who's doing this the clouds are doing this they're dispersing the power of Christ to accomplish all that he commands them on the face of the habitable world and then he makes it very clear whether for correction 
or for his land. That's the inheritance. That's this that was promised to Abraham and finally given to Christ and all those that are his at his coming. Or for love. As it says in the King James, whether for correction or for his land or for mercy, he causes it to happen. We are not talking about clouds and rain here, the kind that make us wet when we go outside in the uh, grayness of a cloudy day. It goes on a little bit further in verse 15 to say this. Do you know how God lays his command upon them and causes the lightnings of his cloud to shine? Well, we could say, yes, we do. We've received all those commands in our hearts. We agree with them fully, regardless of what status they put us in. They elevate us to heavenly places, so we know that much about it. Do we know, do we know how God will cause this lightning, the lightning of his cloud, to shine in that day? Well, we sort of do, but there are so many things about that that we don't know. How, how uh, the resurrection exactly will take place, um, how we will exactly we will, will be judged, and, and what's this moment and a twinkling of an eye in which we will be changed and see our Lord eye to eye, uh, having been watchman all those years and now having the full sight of his face in our eyes and hearing the sound of his voice in our ears and seeing the wonders of his works in this world as it flashes like lightning throughout all the channels and highways and byways of the world. Do you know, in verse 16, do you know the balancings of the clouds, the wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge? Well, we've been given what knowledge we have to whatever extent we can understand, and I think those things we're speaking about this morning. But it's a knowledge that will become full when it happens in our minds, and a knowledge that only a blind man would not want to see. There are some blind men who do want to see it, and God's open, God opens their eyes, but there are others that just can't see it because they're blind. A sad state of people who cannot see the things of God. So going back to this interesting list, again, just to, to reiterate, his judgments are spoken of in the context of a thick cloud that disperses his bright cloud, that they may do whatever he commands them. He causes all that to come for correction, for his land, for mercy. Next item is in the context of God's strength. It's in Psalm 68, which we referred to several times leading up to this point. Let's go there. You can say we're, we've got two slides with, with full of bullets here. I don't think we're going to make it past the first one. So we're going to have to pick it up again next week. Um, I don't mind doing that because the one thing I don't want to do is just race down by these points, condensing them so that you can see the point in, in bulleted form, but without going to the scriptures themselves and getting and gleaning the full substance. It'd be like the difference between sniffing a glass of wine and actually drinking the substance of it. That's the difference. If we just bullet it, or if we go into scriptures and read them. So turn to Psalm 68, and let's look at what that says about clouds. So the first verse in this psalm says God's going to arise. And when it says God shall arise, it's a reference both to the rising of Christ in the political heavens of this world, and it's also because there's, there's a component of that rising that must take place initially in order for that to occur. He's referring also to God manifestation, a rising in the resurrection of the saints and then a rising in Israel as the chosen nation of God and then a rising as the son of righteousness, rise, a rising with healing in his wings. All three of those risings, the resurrection, the rising of Israel as it says in Psalm 60, Rise and shine, for thy light has come. And then the rising of Christ in, in, in the political heavens of this world. All of that rising is embodied in this opening line. God shall arise, and his enemies shall be scattered, and those who hate him shall flee before him. So this is a reference, this psalm is a reference to the second coming of Christ, which is, as we've already said, the standing up of Michael. 
the chariots, that is, who is like God? He stands up, and it becomes a well-known thing in this world over time, who is like God. The chariots of God are twice 10,000, it says in verse 17. Thousands upon thousands, the Lord is among them, Sinai is now in the sanctuary. As you could proceed down to verse 32, it says this, O kingdoms of the earth, now, listen everybody, all these kingdoms where there are, where there is populace, uh, the eyes of, of whose populace now are beginning to see Christ in the fullness of his glory, sing to God, sing praises to the Lord, to him who rides in the heavens, the ancient heavens. Behold, he sends out his voice, his mighty voice, and we've already understood that to be as pronounced as thunderings. Ascribe power to God, whose majesty is over Israel, and whose power is in the... If you read the King James, let's read it there. Ascribe ye strength to God, his excellency is over Israel. Now that's because Messiah has come, and his excellency is now over Israel in the power of its king. And his strength is in the clouds. There's two witnesses in this verse. The witness of Israel, over which Christ will rule as their Messiah, and the witness of the saints who is with him in a great cloud of witnesses and his strength is in the clouds. So if you go back to, to this, there's this wonderful idea in scripture that the strength of Christ is in the people that he assembles to be his administration. The strength of Christ is in the saints we would think, well, how can that be if the strength of Christ is in his character, in his immortality, in the knowledge that he's gained in 2,000 years of being a high priest in heaven at the right hand of his father, if his strength is in the law that will go forth from his mouth, if it's by his breath that he will slay the wicked, then all these things are the personal attributes of Christ which he will bring to the world in the form of wisdom and power and law and righteousness. Transform the world from the one we live in to into peace on earth and goodwill toward men. So why, why do we say, why would God suggest that his strength is in the clouds? Well, look at it this way. We'll just close on this thought. Christ returns and he sits on the throne of his father David, which is a spiritual throne. That means the rulership and the government of Israel, but it's also probably going to be a literal throne um, at the temple at the time he takes his, his position as king. And he doesn't have any saints. There's no hosts of which he is Lord. He's just Jesus, the Messiah that came back to Israel. Maybe there's some angels, but I don't know. But there's no saints. There's no people who have come out of the soil of this world, experienced all its sufferings, know the difference between good and evil, both in their own practice and in, in their observation through a spiritual lens of the world. They're not there. What's he going to do in Brazil? How's he going to calm Europe now? Who's going to feed the people in Africa? How's he going to come to the U.S. and take the conditions that are ripping this country to shreds, making it break up like as if there's a huge political earthquake underneath us and it's collapsing all our foundations? They're not there. Just Jesus on the throne of his father, David. How's that going to work? It's a big planet. There are lots of people in it. He's going to need, essentially, spiritual clones. People who carry his will and his wisdom forth in all the highways and byways where once they were poor and maimed, now they are kings and priests. His strength will be in that host of people. That's where his strength will be manifested. And they will carry out his judgments, as it says in Ezekiel, on a global level. Before I close today, I just want to show you what I meant by uh, the reference to Ezekiel. Let me find out where it is here. Okay, it's, it's the first chapter of Ezekiel uh, that speaks about the Messiah coming out of the north in a great cloud. But I want to show you the context so you understand everything we've spoken of about God's covenant being realized in a cloud which in its fullness rains down righteousness upon the earth. It's, Ezekiel is a good place to go there because the words express the idea I think in a way that is just marvelous. So let's go back there and look at Ezekiel chapter 1. And we'll close with this verse. I remember 
Remember we, we, we made a reference to things whirling around each other, going round and round and round. That's also in Ezekiel 1. But if you look at the fourth verse, it says, As I look, behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. This is the whirlwind that we're speaking about in the whole chapter. A great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, a brightness was uh, about it, and out of the midst thereof, uh, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. And all these, these key words, these descriptions, are also found in Revelation 1, describing Christ and his power. They're found in Daniel 7, describing Christ and his power. And uh, when this fire flashing forth continually is a picture of the emanation of Christ's power like lightning in this world. It's too bright to miss. It's too powerful to resist. And he continues by saying, and out of the midst thereof, of this cloud that came, this great cloud with a fire, that is, I think in this context with the nature of God, because God is an everlasting fire, this cloud uh, also, out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. We know these are the four attributes of Christ's character as they're spoken of in Revelation 4. We know what they mean. We've had lots of exposition on that. But those four living creatures are now embodied in those that are around the throne. They are, they're, they're joining the 24 elders with Christ on the throne and they're, the, they, they're embodied in seven spirits of fire, which in the early days were little seven candles on the top of a, of a lampstand and in the, in the days of the early churches they were seven churches or seven uh, lampstands now they are seven spirits of fire who are here to judge the world as the chapter goes on to say and this was their appearance they had the likeness of a man in other words they were like Christ they were in his image and he was a man a man elevated to the position of sons of God and everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings. And if you go on, uh, it describes in those blue verses um, their operation in the judgments of the nations. Very cryptic language, but that's what they are. And then it says in, uh, in verse 26, and we'll close with this reference, and above the expanse over their heads was the likeness of a throne. And that's the throne of Christ. And the appearance like sapphire, and seated upon, above the likeness of the throne, was the likeness with a human appearance. In other words, he still is Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. He still has the wounds in his hands and in his feet, uh, those with which he was wounded in the house of his friends. And upward from what, he ha from what had the appearance of his waist, or the appearance of fire round about within it, uh, was gleaming metal like, like polished brass, the appearance of fire enclosed all around. And Downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and there was brightness around him. In other words, the likeness of God and his power and the brightness of Christ's rule. And then look at what it says. In, 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 in context of everything we've seen today, this, this incredible picture, he says, like the appearance of a bow, there's the full spectrum of God's power now visible in the world. It's overarching mercy from one end of the earth to the other. As far as the east is from the west, this bow appears in a cloud of witnesses. That is in the cloud on the day of rain. What is that day? So was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. That was the appearance of the saints who have had the character and life of God manifested in them, this great cloud of witnesses, whose appearance was the brightness all around. But the, 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 the focus I want to make in, in closing is that it was in the cloud, this brightness, this power, this assembly of people, uh, and this covenant was in this, this great assembly on the day of rain. Why is it called the day of rain? Because the cloud is so full of righteousness. These people have been collected into a heavenly places that is so full that it will now rain righteousness down upon the earth when they descend with Christ to take their place in all those places in the world who have been starving, arid places, starving and dried up uh, from a scorched earth, scorched through sin and through, through God's judgment to water and fertilize the earth and bring forth all the fruit that will grow in the healing, the 
the rising of the Son of Righteousness. We'll, we'll pick up from there next week.